Finding good YouTube content is the equivalent of finding a diamond in a dumpster. It doesn't happen often and requires countless hours of sifting through literal garbage to find. This dilemma leads us to ask whether this search is worthwhile at all. Well, you no longer have to worry. I've done the dumpster diving for you. ContraPoints is one of those few diamonds. For those who don't know, ContraPoints is one of the many YouTubers that comprise BreadTube, a loosely connected brand of YouTubers who all make video essays and commentary videos from a left-wing perspective. Her videos are all near movie length and address political and philosophical topics in a kind of soft, slow, and almost calming manner. It's hard to explain. Anyway, I posted this drawing I did of her from one of her early videos, and it took off on the ContraPoint subreddit, so much so that I thought maybe I should make a whole video about it. So here we are. I want this video to be a sort of explanation as to how digital art is made, and how seemingly complex illustrations like this are actually rather simple to make if you follow a basic workflow. Before we get to drawing though, it's good to gather some references. I consider myself to be a pretty okay-ish artist, but I still wouldn't be drawing from my imagination or memory alone. I like working with a good Pinterest board of potential color palettes, pose references, and whatever else. I don't consider using references to be cheating at all, and anyone who says otherwise probably just has a fragile ego. References are very helpful because your imagination is inherently limited, so allow yourself to get helped, I don't know. So the first step to creating any illustration is to lay down the sketch layer. I've seen a lot of new artists and people who try out digital art get frustrated at their inability to draw, and a lot of times it's because they don't know they can't just throw lines down on a page and expect them to be perfect, much in the same way you can't construct a house without a blueprint. As you will see, I do multiple sketching layers, starting off with basic shapes and then refining those shapes into something more literal, until the final sketch is a 100% accurate layout for what I want my final lines to be. I've learned from experience that unless you're really confident in your drawing abilities, you don't want to be figuring out where lines should go while you're doing your final line work. Your line should be quick and clean and erasing over and over again just ruins that. So what I did here is I created a new layer for the lines on top of the sketch layer and then minimized the opacity of the sketch so that I could see the lines clearly. This is the second step to creating digital art. That is if your art has lines, not all does, obviously. Something that probably isn't going to show up in the time lapse is the fact that I frequently flip the canvas every so often. Uh, what this does is allow yourself to see the drawing from a fresh perspective. There's a funny phenomenon that happens when you look at your art for too long. You become kind of unable to recognize its true shape or its flaws. Like, you won't be able to see that the pose is lopsided or the face or body is warped on one side or something. Flipping the canvas or just taking a break for a few minutes can be very helpful for noticing these obvious errors. Something you might have noticed is how clean and precise the lines are. It's good to get into the habit of avoiding sketching the lines. If you have a nice long arm like I have here, just use one line. Don't sketch it with a bunch of lines. A lot of amateur artists love to sketch every arc and shape they can because it's just a lot easier to do it that way. But it just looks so much better to minimize the amount of lines used in my opinion, whatever that's worth. Also something you'll notice I do with the lines is I add thickness to a lot of areas. This gives the line art a sense of depth, and that weight variation is helpful for making it appear more interesting. You'll also notice that I only add that weight to the underside of objects, or where one object overlaps another, such as at the bottom of the hair or underneath the chin. And after the lines comes the flat base color layer that will be placed underneath the lines layer. I think now is a good time to explain that the lines of the background and the character here are not on the same layer. It's a good idea to keep the foreground, midground, and background elements separated from each other so that they can be freely manipulated whenever you want. This principle is referred to as non-destructive editing, and it's the core basis of digital art. After the base color has been created, I then go ahead and add the various other colors 
such as the skin color, the hair colors, the colors of the accessories, all on top of the base color. By turning the base color into a mask, I can make the layers above it stay within the boundaries of the lines automatically. I'll illustrate what I mean here. I have the base layer colored here, in this case it's a blue blob, but by creating a layer above it and masking it to the layer beneath it, all of the lines I draw now remains within the boundaries of that bottom layer. Pretty helpful, huh? Now what I'm doing here with the background is the next step, which is adding shading. You might be wondering why I'm coloring the shadows with a blue color, but that's because shading is done the fastest if we simply choose a cool color, such as blue in this case, and then set the shading layer to multiply and then decrease the opacity to around 50% or so as needed. What the blending effect multiply does is essentially take this blue color and multiply it or mix it with any colors it's placed above. Pretty neat. A lot of amateur artists like to simply use a darker tone of the source color when shading, and that tends to look really flat. Cool shadows mimic real life, which is why it looks better. Something I really like about this drawing is how the light comes from below the face, which gives it a kind of menacing look. In nature, light coming from below is kind of unnatural, as the sun is pretty much always above us, so we're not really used to what shadows look like when they're being cast upwards. Kind of interesting, the more you know I guess. I move on here to the character again, using a gouache type brush to add a light variety onto the flat color. All this does is further add a level of detail and dimension to the figure to make it look less flat. And now here, I'm just adding another shadow layer set to multiply, this time as a sort of gradient from top to bottom. I will paint it in and then blur it with the Gaussian blur effect. Again, all of this is being done to add more depth to the image. As you can see, I ended up changing the shadows on the face because I felt like it didn't look quite right. Again, this was an easy fix because of non-destructive editing. All I had to do was return to that shadow layer and alter it. If I had painted the shadows onto the same layer as the color, then that would have been much more difficult to revise. I really can't stress enough just how important non-destructive editing is. And the final asset I have to render is the front microphone. Uh, now, I wasn't totally sure how to render the metal, so what I ended up doing was placing a single layer of sharp, flat shadows like I've been using this entire time, and then underneath that add a gradient of dark grey to light grey, which I feel mimicked the look of metal really well. I wasn't even looking at my references, so that was just kind of my intuition, I guess. And then I duplicated the microphone layers, and then flattened that duplicate and blurred it with the Gaussian blur effect, so that it didn't become too visually distracting. At first, it can be kind of hard to blur all the work you did, but now I find having some blurred elements really helps sell the illustration as being taken by a real camera, which is just a style I like. And after adding a last layer of white as a light gradient to everything, I duplicate the entire image, then flatten it, and add some post effects. The one I really like is the noise filter, which adds a layer of grain over top of everything. I go for about 5% grain, as it's noticeable but still subtle enough to not be too distracting. Grain is pretty important for having an illustration feel authentic, as it harkens back to a time when animation was done traditionally, on paper instead of digitally. I also add a chromatic aberration filter set to 10%, which takes the edges of the objects and gives them a kind of rainbow glow. Pretty interesting. I like it anyway. And that's the drawing. I know just hearing me describe what I'm doing might be a bit confusing, but I hope by seeing the illustration time lapse and some footage of how the layer hierarchy is ordered that it all might make sense. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. I hope I was able to make this more sensible and entertaining than my last drawing video was. So if you like this video, consider subscribing, uh, please. I really want to hit a thousand subs before the end of the year, and it would mean a lot to me if that happens. So yeah, thanks for watching this video, bye.